Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said, when the Advocate comes, whom I will send from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who comes from the Father, he will testify to me. You also are to testify to me because you have been with me from the beginning. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I am going to the one who sent me, and because I say these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you, it is to your benefit that I go away. But if, because if I do not go away, the advocate will not come. But if I go, I will send the advocate. And when the advocate comes, the advocate will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin because they did not believe in me about righteousness because I am going to the Father and you will see me me no more, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth because he will not speak on his own but he will speak whatever he hears and declare to you the things that are to come. The spirit of truth will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. That is why I said he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. It was Pentecost. The followers of Jesus were gathered together in their home, their house, the place where they had celebrated their relationship with the risen Christ. They knew that they couldn't go on as they were, huddled together, struggling to survive. But they didn't know where they should go or how they would get there. All throughout Jerusalem, people really didn't know and they really didn't care that the followers of Jesus were huddled together in that house. A few people did. They were saying it's a shame about those followers of Jesus. It's so sad that they closed up shop. I used to belong to them when Jesus was doing miracles and attracting the crowds. But there were problems and I fell away. I heard Jesus got in trouble with with the police making political statements. And they condemned him to death. Yeah, there the disciples were, huddled together in in one place, not sure of their future, when something happened. Wind and fire and spirit and life. And the disciples remembered who Jesus was and what Jesus was about, bringing life out of death. And they came out of their house and they proclaimed to the world that the cross could not keep Jesus down. That God raised Jesus from the dead And that in Jesus there is life, even in the midst of death. And the fire burned in their hearts. And the wind of the Spirit blew in their lives. And they left their house and traveled the known world. And the church of all times and of all places, was born. 
Sunday is Pentecost. Or maybe it's today. Here we are gathered in our house, our assembly hall, the place where hopefully we've experienced and celebrated our relationship with the risen Christ. We know that the church can't go on as it is, huddled together and struggling to survive. But we're not sure where we should go or how we should get there. All throughout Northwest Lower Michigan, most people don't know and don't care that our synod is meeting in assembly. A few do. They're saying, it's a shame about those Lutherans. It's sad that they're closing up shop. I used to belong to them, but they made some decisions. They ran out of money. There were problems. And I fell away. But other people in Michigan, they're saying something different. They're saying that the Northwest Lower Michigan Synod, its congregations, and this ELCA are courageous. They're saying those Lutherans, they live out their faith. Even when to do so means making hard decisions. Even when to do so means facing problems head on. Even when to do so means risking that people might fall away. Here we are in our assembly hall, not sure of where we're going or we're or how we're going to get there. But God is. You see, as Sarah and David and I travel across the synod, we see that God is bringing a Pentecost here, a Pentecost now. Pentecost in our congregations and in our synod, very much like that other Pentecost. You see, we know that the cross couldn't keep Jesus down, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that in the midst of death, even the death of yesterday's church, there is life. Because while yesterday's church may be dead, Jesus is not. The good news on this day is that Jesus is sending his Spirit, the Holy Spirit, as Jesus did on that first Pentecost, here, now, today, on us, as we disassemble our assembly, as we say our prayers and turn off the lights and bid each other farewell, something is still happening. Jesus is sending the Holy Spirit. What's that you say? You don't hear the rush of the wind? Sometimes it's easier to perceive what is blown than what is blowing. Holy Spirit. <laughs> if the assembly evaluations are, every, are right from years past, 
some of the most important things we did in these days is to connect with old friends and to make new ones. Would you agree? Perhaps in those conversations, you glimpsed where the Holy Spirit, that mischievous Holy Spirit, has blown brothers and sisters since last assembly. And maybe you have a hunch of where the Holy Spirit will be blowing brothers and sisters, congregations in the coming year. I'm really grateful for the first time voting members and the visitors that the Holy Spirit has blown into this assembly. Thank you for coming. I'm really grateful for the new rostered leaders that the Holy Spirit has blown into this synod. I am still struggling that the Holy Spirit is blowing rostered leaders out of the synod. <laughs> this was not part of my plan. I rejoice that the Holy Spirit blew some of us out of this building to serve the people of Lansing. I suspect that the mischievous Holy Spirit is not done blowing us out of our buildings and into the streets to proclaim Christ, but more importantly, to encounter Christ. So if you want to feel the wind of the Holy Spirit, let go of your pew. Yeah, something is happening in this synod. Wind and fire and spirit and life. What's that you say you don't see the tongues of fire? Look at the people around you. Look at, look above their heads. Look at their hats. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask someone about their hat. Why are they wearing their hat? How does their hat indicate the way that they've been anointed by the Holy Spirit? I suspect if you really ask them the question and look in their eyes, you'll see the fire. I'm wearing a mitre, a bishop's hat. When I became bishop, I got a lecture telling me to never, 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 never wear a mitre. Because <laughs> a mitre is a symbol, I was told, of a hierarchical, patriarchal, power-protecting church. Then I found myself sitting across the table with the leaders of our Sudanese worshiping community. I was sitting with Jack Eggleston from Southeast, who is the interim director of Evangelical Mission. Our Sudanese congregation had a problem. They had, I think, 12 to 15 kids that needed baptizing and no Sudanese pastor to baptize them. I listened and then I said, what an American bishop do? They talked for a little while in Dinka, a language I don't understand, and finally somebody said, yes, if you dress the part. <laughs> you see, Bishop, we may not understand much of what you say, just what a former preaching professor wants to hear. <laughs> We may not understand much of what you say, but if you wear the mitre, Bishop, you know what about, about the mitre, right? And I'm thinking hierarchical, patriarchal, power protecting <laughs> church. Tell me, they said, I said, and our Sudanese leaders explained that the triangle shape of the mitre is a reminder 
that tongues as a fire appeared among the disciples. And one tongue rested over each of the apostles and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke as the Spirit gave them ability. They reminded me, they told me, that the tapers in the back are poured waters of baptism where we all receive the Spirit. And they said to me, Bishop, if you wear the mitre, we will know that you know that the Holy Spirit is in the church, uniting us, holding us together, and empowering us to pro proclaim the gospel. And it really won't matter if we don't understand what you say. I went out and got a mitre. I actually have two. One, the white one, sits on my desk. I pray with it every day. In the way we prayed with the crosses on the tables Sunday evening, and some of us prayed with Luther roses yesterday afternoon, I pray with it every day. I wear it on occasion. It reminds me of so much. First, it reminds me that it really is is about the Holy Spirit, right? That the Spirit is alive and well and working in our synod. And sometimes I really need to be reminded of that. The mitre also reminds me that sometimes the Holy Spirit testifies, speaks to me, to us, to the church, declares the things that are to come through people I wouldn't at first expect. Thank you, my Sudanese brothers. And so I need to listen to everyone. But most, and the church needs to listen to everyone. But most importantly, wearing the mitre makes me feel uncomfortable. Not because I feel hierarchical and patriarchal and power protecting, but because I feel small and insignificant. Just one of the many who wear the mitre across the centuries and around the world in Christ's church. It really is all about the wind and the fire of the Spirit that Jesus sends. You want to see the fire? Take two minutes. Turn to somebody around you and ask them about their hat. Why are they wearing the hat they're wearing? And how is it a sign that they are anointed by the Holy Spirit? Are you ready to talk? Does anyone need more time? <laughs> Go! <laughs> Let me know when two minutes are up. Gotcha. It's <laughs> the one thing I forgot. That's all right. I have a tiger's hat, though. There you go. How do you, what, what how's it? <laughs> what, say that again? How is it a sign of the spirit? <laughs> that was good. How is your hat a sign of oh, the spirit? Um, well, uh, my aunt and uncle uh, moved to Sarasota. Uh, my dad's aunt and uncle used to live here. 
and when we went down to see them for the first time since he passed, uh, we went oh, to a wow. Tigers game for spring training, uh, the last one against the Yankees, and I got that there. So wow, that's, that's a great story. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Are they still going at it? What? How, how, are they still going at it? Yeah. A little bit. They're kind of mingling. Now. All right. So did you see the fire? Did you see the fire? The spirit at work is at work in this synod. And the Spirit is saying, yes, being the church is hard. Being the church is uncertain. Being the church is scary. But being the church is what I have anointed you to be. And the Spirit is promising us this, that the cross could not keep Jesus down that God raised Jesus from the dead. In Christ, there is life even in the face of death. Even in the face of death of yesterday's church. The church will be reborn. Something is happening in this synod. We have the Spirit the spirit at work in this synod is generous. Carey calls them godsend moments. Moments in the office when we're planning an assembly and we don't know how we're going to do it or how we're going to get it done or where we're going to get the resources and someone from this synod honestly calls in and says, you know, I could do that. I could give that. The spirit at work in this synod is generous. The spirit at work in this synod is loving. Pastor Sarah sees it in congregations as they welcome new pastors. I can think of many, but today I'm thinking of Connie and Travis and David Blank. Ask of, oh, and Shirsten Pretty, who calls this a unicorn synod. <laughs> you want to hear about the loving spirit at work in this synod? Ask them. The spirit at work in this synod is full of vision. David sees it in congregations who not only resign themselves, get, but get excited about the fact that the Spirit is calling them to work together for the sake of God's own mission in the world. And the Spirit at work in this synod is daring. I hope you have not lost sight of how daring it was to call as your bishop someone who manages a disability. Because I have not forgotten how daring that was. And if you ask Pastor Strickland, he will tell you the church notices it too. 
The spirit at work in this synod is alive. As Sarah and David and I visit congregations, we ask, what is God doing in your midst? No one has said nothing. (laughs) No one has said Jesus has left the building. You tell us stories about how Jesus is bringing life among you and how Jesus is bringing life through you to your communities. It'd be really good if you would tell those stories to yourselves and to each other and to your neighbors. Use the word Jesus, don't say goulash. (laughs) And it really is as simple as talking about a hat. Yeah, the spirit at work in this synod is generous, loving, full of vision, daring, and alive. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? So the spirit at work in this synod is holy. It's holy. Something is happening in Northwest Lower Michigan among the Lutherans. Wind and fire and spirit and life. The fire of the spirit burns in our house. The wind of the spirit blows us from the assembly hall. And so after one more stop at the table, when we will celebrate our relationship with the risen Christ, we go to God knows where. We go to proclaim that the cross could not keep Jesus down. That God raised Jesus from the dead. That in the face of death, in Jesus there is life, even the death of yesterday's church. And in the death of this gathering of disciples, the church in our synod will be reborn. Amen.